Hello, uh, welcome to the preparing for the CKA, CKAD, and CKS practical exams. My name is Tim Sorowitz. Uh, I am a uh, senior trainer and course developer for the Linux Foundation. Uh, I currently write the Kubernetes courses. Uh, you can reach me uh, on Twitter at uh, my handle there, as well as on LinkedIn. Um, so how do I get started? How do I prepare for an exam? Well, uh, the first thing I would suggest is to take a class. Uh, so there is a URL here listed, and I've added the PDF to this presentation. So you should be able to find it and read it the the link use the link easily uh, but if you go to training.linuxfoundation.org slash training slash course catalog there are two courses currently with one on the way that would help you prepare kubernetes for app developers lfd 459 would prepare you for the ckad exam kubernetes administration lfs 458 is to prepare you for the CKA exam. And the soon to be released, uh, I'm writing it still, uh, Kubernetes Security Fundamentals course, LFS 460, will have topics that you can expect to find on the CKS exam. Let's take a, a quick look over here at the website itself. So I've gone to training.linuxfoundation.org slash training slash course catalog. Uh, and we can, of course, there's a lot of different options here. I'm going to go down to technology and then choose Kubernetes. After it updates, you can see this is how you can view uh, what is in some of these courses. Uh, so, for example, if I wanted to look at the LFD 459, uh, you can see that uh, you can learn some of these topics. Uh, you can also uh, see more information about what exactly we cover. So uh, in the, the build chapter, some of these things about probes. I mentioned this because we're going to see this list of items again uh, in a little bit. Now, this is an in-person uh, course. We also have self-paced uh, courses that are LFD 259. If you look at the topics here, uh, it is, um, scroll down, you'll see it's the same topics. So you have a chance to uh, view the same topics. It's not instructor-led, it's not in-person, it's self-paced instead, uh, covering the same topics. So a lot of people ask, is this course the only thing I need to do to pass the exam? And really what a lot of those questions are is, is this a brain dump? Will you just tell me what I need to memorize so that I can take the exam on the, the next day, pass, uh, and then quickly forget everything that I memorized? Uh, these are not brain dump classes. Our goal is to teach you the real skills you'll need in the position so that you can do the actual job. If you take the course, if you go through the lab exercises until you have mastery of them, if you do a little bit of studying, which I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit, uh, then you have a very high percentage chance of passing. These courses are updated all the time because the certification exam matches the product being released, which also updates all the time. Currently, it is on a three-month uh, update or refresh. So something to be aware of, as you look around at some of the options, you might find materials that are out of date, that are four or five releases old. Be aware that some of that information may not be useful uh, and in fact, it's, it can no longer work and it might cause you some serious problems. So we at the Linux Foundation work very hard to keep these materials up to the version of Kubernetes that the exam is using, which also uh, is a, a very recent 
uh, release to it. So the goal of the courses is not a brain dump for the exams, but uh, I'm the guy who writes the courses and I take these exams on a regular basis and I make sure that, uh, that you are getting the kinds of skills that you need, plus again, practice uh, and uh, some preparation to pass these exams. So a lot of uh, folks also are used to various types of exam uh, process. So this, these exams, all three of these exams are practical exams. Uh, and in case you haven't taken a practical exam before, let's talk about what that means. The exam environment will be uh, one that you take online via a browser, a very particular type of browser, which we'll talk about here in a sec but it's command line driven. So you will be staring at a prompt for you to run your commands. There will also be a list of bullet points, items that need to be true when you're finished. So that means you would read one of these items and from that, you would see a list of, um, uh, for example, the user Bob has to find a web server at uh, this location with this content uh, and, and they would provide the location. So it's up to you to do the various steps necessary such that there's a web server with that content that the user, Bob, can get access to. There is no multiple guests, there's no essay, it's entirely practical. It's also not one of those demo systems where if you click one button or the other kind of tells you and the grading goes with it saying, well, you chose poorly and you go down a different path. It's not like that. You will be, uh, you'll have a prompt that you can then get to one or more clusters and you could make it worse. Uh, if you, and this happens when you're in a rush, when you're hurrying, you could do something that causes that node, that cluster to have serious issues and not work at all. Just like in the real world, when you're trying to fix something at two o'clock in the morning uh, and you're in a rush, you're not that awake, you could make things worse. So some of the ways to approach this exam, something to think about as you wait for this exam uh, is that part of that process is you can flag an item meaning that inside of that list, you have some options of, of uh, hitting a little key and flagging it saying, for whatever reason, I'd like to come back to it, I'd like to remember it. I mention this because time management is one of the biggest challenges with taking a practical exam. That you have two hours uh, for the exams now, both CKA and CKAD are two hour exams, and I believe the CKS exam will also be two hours. That as you uh, go through it, it, it's easy to get stuck on something uh, and devote a lot of time thinking, I have to get past it. And there could be many items afterwards that you're able to do uh, very quickly. So what I encourage you to do is read ahead, take a look at the various questions and do a little bit of time management. Is it better that I spend half an hour on this one item or should I flag it and then come back in the future and then try to fix it if I get everything else that I know done and I have some time left over. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say common, but I've, I've talked to more than one candidate where they, they mentioned they got stuck on something and spent the rest of the time working on it. Uh, and as a result, uh, did not pass. So mentally prepare to look where you're going, uh, flag in a thing for returning to it later, and if you find yourself getting stuck, keep an eye on that, that countdown timer. Uh, whether it's if I'm there more than five minutes or 10 minutes, it's really up to what works best for you. Uh, but you know, say, you know what, I will move on. I won't just sit there. I know a lot of times technology people, we like to just, uh, you know, dog with a bone, not let it go. So plan for this, prepare for it as you sit for the uh, exam. Now, the exam uh, environment uh, is, is somewhat unique because you're going to be taking these certification exams online. So there are various uh, candidate requirements and system requirements that you have to meet in, able, in order to be able to do that. 
Now, if we uh, if we go here, I'm going to go back to the uh, the main page here, and we're going to go up to certification, certification catalog, and I'm just going to scroll down and see we have many different certifications. Uh, but here, for example, is the CKA certification, so view certification, and you can see more information. Uh, about that and the kinds of things that you'll see. And again, we're going to see this list again. Uh, and at the bottom of this output, you'll notice that it mentions, again, a online proctored performance-based test. So you have two hours. There's going to be somebody watching you on a webcam and listening to you the entire time. It's something to be aware of. It can be disconcerting at first. Now, there is a candidate handbook I'm going to select the candidate handbook. And this page is about the various requirements and registration. It's really what you need to know as far as logistics for signing up uh, and taking the exam. So I would encourage you to go through each one of these bullet points one at a time. So for example, uh, candidate requirements. Uh, uh, so a current version of Chrome or Chromium, that's the kind of browser you need to use. So if you're used to using something else, you have a custom browser, you have uh, a very uh, rare browser perhaps, it may not work. And I, I would encourage you to test this as early as possible. There is a hardware compatibility check that will test to make sure that your browser checks for a microphone and a camera and so forth. And it checks to see if you can pass and it is then a, a supported browser, but Chrome or Chromium uh, is the browser. They mention, you know, try to get reliable internet access. You will need a microphone and then the webcam. Now the webcam is capable of being moved. The proctor will ask you to show it around your environment. So the, they need to see where your keyboard is, if there's anything underneath your keyboard. They want to make sure that you're in a quiet space. There's nobody with signs next to you, uh, you know, over the back of the monitor showing you all the various steps and information. You'll need to show your ID to them. Your name must match exactly uh, in that before the proctor will enable the exam for you. Um, so again, that hardware compatibility check is a great thing to do, again, as early as possible. And remember what the browser is that you were using. So I uh, mentioned the candidate identification and authentication. So again, the proctor will need to see your ID clearly, verify your name matches exactly what uh, whoever signed up for it. Uh, there's also an exam prep checklist uh, that is another uh, handy, and you come down here, exam preparation checklist. And you can work through this uh, and this is part of, of a automated process when uh, a setting up for and enrolling in the exam. Uh, you agree to the uh, candidate agreement that you won't talk about the contents of the exam with anybody at any time. Verify your name, platform, schedule it, system requirements again. Get that handbook that I'm showing you. And of course, read the various important instructions. Um, so each one of these things is important to, to go through. You can also export it as a PDF. So if you want to search for it in a singular place, you can export all of this document and view it as a PDF. So if, for example, I'm going to export it as PDF, and that should pop up here uh, in a second. Um, the reason for that is I, I'm old school paper guy, but... Uh, um, the uh, advantage to this is that you can also easily search. So one of the things I'm going to search for, so Control F, is the word blog. Now, why did I search the word blog? Well, inside of this, again, you're going to read the whole document. But one thing I want to call your attention to is page 139 out of 198. So it's a bit in there. That's why I searched for it. Uh, during the exam, candidates may review the exam content instructions. Review documents installed in the distribution. Great. Use their Chrome or Chromium browser to open one additional tab in order to access assets at HTTPS Kubernetes.io docs, github.com Kubernetes, kubernetes.io slash blog, and their uh, various subdomains. 
just and only those pages and, and the pages underneath them. This is a, I think, an important part of preparing for the exam, that you have bookmarked already all of the pages that you need in the browser you're going to use for the exam. Another thing to keep in mind is that you'll need to double check that the version of the exam you're signing up for is the one that you're learning with and practicing on. Now, Kubernetes is an active and dynamic open source project, thus many things change. As a result, there is going you should expect changes between versions. Now that we're at 1.19 with 1.20 coming out soon, it's less dynamic than it was between 1.6 and 1.7, but those changes could be important to what you're trying to do in the exam. So I want to encourage you to make sure you know which version of the exam you're signing up for and that that matches the version that you're bookmarking YAML for and that you're doing the lab exercises for and that you're working with. Another bit of information that we can gain access to, uh, again, back to, to, uh, to this page, if we go to the previous page um, that we, we came from in training, they mentioned there is a curriculum overview, and that brings you to a, uh, a GitHub location, which is right here. Uh, it takes sometimes a little bit to come up, so I wanted to, to have it saved. So github.com slash cncf slash curriculum which is right here. And inside of that, you'll see that there are now three different PDFs, one for CKAD, one for the CKA, and a CKS curriculum, which says is coming in November. Now, you notice these other two documents, they were updated two months ago, version 1.19. These are updating all the time, just like our course updates all the time. So you want to make sure you know which one you're going to be looking at. So for example, I'm going to select the CKAD, it's the top one, and it generates this PDF for me to look at. I'm gonna scroll down into this PDF and we see that uh, it is the knowledge, skills, and abilities that a certified Kubernetes application developer can be expected to demonstrate. So as you go through this list, I would print it out or open up a browser and write out every section and every bullet point so that you have your own editable list of all of these items. Underneath each one, write out the commands that you would use. So kubectl create, uh, kubectl edit, kubectl get, whatever the commands are to do that bullet point, I would write out inside of that Word document and use that then, you now you have a list of all the bullet points, you have a list of all the commands to complete all the bullet points, and you can then use this as a study aid going through this as, as quickly as you can. One thing to be aware of as you're writing out the steps is what the word understand means. For example, understand Kubernetes API primitives. Uh, here we see understand liveness probes and readiness probes. Hmm, where did I see that before? Well, before we get into where you saw it before, the word understand. In this context, if you see understand, it's not that you could find it on a page. It's like, where's Waldo? Hey, I know what that is. The word understand in this context means you know how to create it, you know how to integrate it, you know troubleshooting, and perhaps proper removal of whatever that thing is. So understand is actually a really big term in this list. A lot of people, when they read through it, they're like, yeah, I know what a liveness probe is. That's not what they mean. They, the word understand in this context means you know how to do everything that you might need to do with that. So that means that in this case, liveness probes and readiness probes, can you create a new one? Can you integrate it into your existing equipment? Can you troubleshoot it if there's a problem with a liveness probe? Can you remove an existing liveness probe such that the container and the pod continue to run after you remove it? So the, the, each one of those steps you'll need to know. Now to call back to something I was mentioning before, 
was when we were looking at uh, some of these little items here. All of these items you'll notice that are in our table of contents are indeed tied to a bullet point someplace so that you have a direct understanding that I don't want you to just memorize the two things and not know what a liveness probe is. I want you to understand how to use it and use it in a production environment, which then again equips you uh, to pass a practical exam. So now that we have our list, we have a Word document, uh, we have uh, all of our stuff written out, Google document, and we write out the commands to create, integrate, fix each one of that. Also, in the allowed browser, okay, so remember it's in the allowed browser, we make a, I, for example, would suggest making a new folder, save the bookmarks for all of your YAML for each one of those bullet points. Now, which, how do I know what that is? Find and test the YAML for that particular exam version, where in one of those three directories we saw in the uh, candidate guide. It's important because the Kubernetes IO docs page has a lot of information on it. So if you don't know where to look, it might take you some time to find it, even through searching. And if you search, it could be that that page did not get updated from a previous version. So every three months, there's a new version of Kubernetes. People are not going through every page of all documentation and making sure that it all still works. It would be nice if that was the case, it's not. So you need to test the YAML and only bookmark it, only put it in that new folder if you know it works. So you would find the information in Kubernetes IO docs or the GitHub Kubernetes uh, or the blog location, one of those three uh, pages and their, their sub pages. This is the readiness probes. Okay, here's the YAML, here's the link. So your Google Doc now with all those items, you have every single command you need to type and you have the YAML saved in the bookmark and you can also remember then, like uh, mentally associate those YAML names the bookmark names to that section of the code. Uh, I would also encourage you then to use a countdown timer. Most people who haven't taken one of our practical exams in the past uh, run out of time. And it's because in, in the class, whether it's self-paced or instructor-led, uh, you have, you know, an hour to do one portion of the lab, or if it's self-paced, you have however long you want to take to do that one portion of the lab. And you know, some people get used to, okay, in an hour, I can do this one item. No problem. I'll go slow. I'll read the stuff. I'll figure it out. You only have two hours to configure perhaps 18, 20 different items. As a result, if you don't practice at a quick pace, when you're sitting in the exam and you have to have a quick base, you're going to make more mistakes. You're going to make more typos. So how do you know when you're ready? What I always suggest to people is you have this long list of items, everything that could be on the exam. You have all your YAML, so you can copy paste the uh, known good content, then practice it. Could I do everything in two hours? Now, everything is, is a very big term. People sometimes get worried. Something to keep in mind is some of this might be difficult to do for anybody in two hours. So, you know, if there's something that you happen to find that you're like, how could they even cause me to do that in two hours? Well, keep that in mind. That might be something that I spend the least amount of time focusing and studying as distinct from stuff that might only take five or 10 minutes to do. And uh, that, you know, is worth getting the YAML and the steps uh, to, to work with. So practice how you're going to need to perform. Now, of course, the nice thing about a two hour exam, it's also when you have an outage, you're trying to fix something, you're, you know, your boss is sitting over your shoulder tapping their foot, why isn't, why isn't it working? So the, it, is, it's, it means that in a stressful situation, you can perform and you know stuff such that without somebody telling you exactly what to type, you can fix or configure something with Kubernetes. Now, um, that was, I. let's go back here, Paige. I want to talk about some of the other lists here. So let me go back. And so that was CKAD. Let's look at the CKA curriculum. Again, now this is a two-hour exam. 
Uh, it used to be three hours and now it's two hours, but you can see a similar uh, bullet point list of items. So managed role-based access control. Now the word manage, that's another one like understand that, well, uh, I need to know what that is. I need to know what a role is in a cluster role and a role binding and a cluster role binding and all the YAML that goes into that. So there might be five different uh, bookmarks just for that first bullet point. Plus, uh, you know, it's, it's effectively a five-step process to uh, add RBAC uh, settings for some action. So you have to understand it, you have to write out those five actions, and then four or five different types of YAML files that are all a little bit particular. It's YAML again, white space and dense. You want a good working copy of all of that to then use. Uh, use QBDM to install a basic cluster. Okay, well, installing a cluster, that's something that just takes a while, just installing the software and depending where you're starting. So as I was mentioning, as you look at these bullet points, uh, should I try to get QBDM installed in two hours and everything else? If you can do that, great. But that might be one of those bullet points that you say, well, I better know how QBDM works and what the output is. I, I should know about that. How do I use it? But would I need to do start to finish? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't hurt to have a YAML bookmark just in case. You can work through them. Again, all of these items, you'll notice, look just like our table of contents, in this case, for the uh, LFS 458 course. Now, the new exam that's coming out, the CKS exam, this is yet to be released. Uh, I had a chance to take a beta version of it uh, and see a little bit about it. Uh, it is, uh, none of them are easy, but this one is especially so, uh, especially not easy. In order to take the CKS exam, at least at the moment, uh, there is a requirement that you have a existing CKA certification. So as a result, there might be a lot of things that you know how to do because of your CKA information. So I would not, um, I would not just try to take this course and say, well, I'm just going to get the CKS. I'm going to be the security specialist. I don't actually have to know Kubernetes in order to get that certification. Uh, I think you're setting yourself up for a really rough two hours if that's what you do. So understand that there's an assumption that you already have the CKA and thus can use that information. With that, you know, that experience, that knowledge, then we add to it. Uh, the CKA, CKAD are about enabling stuff, getting stuff to work. Security is kind of the opposite of that. We're locking stuff down. We're making sure people, whether they're friendlies or not, can't do something. As a result, the level of complexity is much higher because you could restrict something using multiple different tools in multiple different ways. And that sometimes that uh, uh, is a option fatigue. Well, which one do they want? Which one do they do? Again, it's a practical exam. It's not about the process that you're following, uh, unless it, it declares the tool to use, of course, but we're following the process, not some uh, arbitrary, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're following the outcome, not some arbitrary process. Uh, so uh, as we look through this list, you know, it's cluster setup. Well, not QBADM cluster setup. What we're talking about here is, is it secure? Um, the uh, things like updating Kubernetes frequently, that's something that we learn in the CKA course. We actually do an upgrade from one version to another as part of our lab exercises. Um, appropriately use kernel hardening tools such as AppArmor or uh, SecCom. AppArmor. So if you haven't used AppArmor before, uh, which maybe you, you haven't, it's not the most common tool, uh, perhaps you should brush up on it and say, oh, what are the basics? And again, you know, where do I get that information? You can't go to just any website. So with some limitations, how do I find enough that I could do some basic app armor work with my uh, Kubernetes cluster? Uh, looking at vulnerabilities. Now, some of these tools like uh, PSP, uh, pod security policies, that's a very common thing to configure for your cluster. OPA, which is the open policy agent, is a centralization of your entire environment 
to a single policy engine. That is potentially, we could probably talk for a week about OPA alone. So again, you know, it says set, set up appropriate domains using something like PSV, OPA, and security context. I, I would, of course, encourage you to know OPA. I think it's going to be the future and PSP is going to go away eventually once uh, OPA and Gatekeeper become very stable. But again, as you approach this list, keep in mind what is it that the practical exam will expose me to? What are they going to ask me to do? Which is some sort of security domains with pod security policies and security context and using some tools to do that. Manage Kubernetes secrets. Well, we talk about secrets in the CKA exam, but perhaps there's something else you need to know. For example, in our uh, CKA course, we talk about using a secret, but that it's encoded, not encrypted information. So perhaps it'd be good to know how to have at rest encryption and how to configure that. So again, you want to write out the steps, the commands, you want to write out the YAML files so you know where to get it. Uh, and if you have something on that, there is, uh, for example, there's something in the uh, Kubernetes AO docs that says these are the six steps to causing secrets to be encrypted, not just encoded. So uh, just like the other lists, we want to write them out underneath each one, put the commands if there is a command list and any associated YAML files in those allowed spaces. Now, some of these might be a a little difficult to study for, detect all phases of attack, regardless where it occurs and how it spreads. So, you know, that bullet point, just do everything at any time in any way. That's all we're asking of you. Uh, that might be a little bit more difficult to write out the steps, but it is definitely something to consider uh, and say, are we looking at all our attack services? Um, who is auditing us? Are we auditing ourselves? And the course that I'm writing goes into some of this uh, information so that it's a holistic security. You're not just turning bells and whistles. You're also trying to look at who would be getting to your cluster, how would they be getting, and trying to do a little bit of what do we not know, uh, which is always a very difficult, probably the most difficult thing to do uh, with security. But for example, if your uh, door key reader is tied into your IT infrastructure, is it vulnerable? Could somebody walk to the outside of your building and take over that key reader and thus have access inside your environment and get to your Kubernetes cluster and then use that as a, a hopping point to uh, take over the rest? And if you think about it, just about every building in the world has a key reader so employees can get in. Is there one in a back door without much light that somebody could spend a night and, and take over? These are all parts of security. It's not just typing one command. It's looking at all the many ways, perhaps having a devious mind. Uh, what are the ways somebody could get around and how do I stop that? Also, there is the balance of access and um, usefulness. So if you turn the machine off, you bury it in cement and you drop it into a mine shaft, yeah, not a lot of people can get access to that data, but you can't either. So uh, keep that in mind as you study these various bullet points and as you prepare, uh, you know, for example, could I use audit logs to monitor access? Yeah, that's something that, you know, I find in the docs, here's the pages, here's the eight steps to do it. This is the file I do, this is how I rotate it, and, and I can do that. Uh, you know, various tools for scanning vulnerabilities. This content, just to be aware, it uses a lot of outside resources. So not just the Kubernetes project, but you're gonna see some of the other 80 or 90 different CNCF projects that uh, are in use. Now, once, of course, you do all this, you study, and you pass your exam, what, do you, what does this all mean? Well, one of the neat things that I'd like to mention is that the Linux Foundation offers digital badges. And here we see a link uh, for training.linuxfoundation.org slash badges, two, uh, and brings you to this page here. Now, what, what I like about this is, uh, and there's the various sections, overview, how it works, badge offerings, and so forth, is that this digital badge, this little icon, which we'll see coming up here, uh, and here we see uh, CKA, CKAD, and once the CKS exam uh, rolls out, you're going to see another icon for that. But each one of these is something that you can actually click on. And when you click on that 
um, that badge, then it will connect you to Credly's acclaim site, and it will say who has that certification, what the certification is in, and when it was good for. You know, is it forever, or does it have a start and end date? That what this allows is it's not just a neat feature. Think about it from the, uh, for example, the hiring perspective. If I have 500 resumes to go through, I could do a lot of research and read and, and do some searching. Or if there's a nice little button and I can click it and say, yeah, Tim does have that certification and look, it's active or, or just recently expired and he has all this stuff. Hey, that goes into the least let's keep a look at file. So I'm a big fan of it, and as I've gotten a lot of feedback from management types uh, that they are really a fan of these digital badges because it's very difficult uh, for somebody to, to spoof it. That they didn't just photocopy somebody else's cert and, and send it in. It's going to verify the exact certification times, names, and so forth. So as a result, um, these, you know, the hiring people, your management, are really excited about it. Uh, and so as a result, when you pass, I want to encourage you to put your various icons, put it in your LinkedIn page, put it in your, your email, uh, put it in your, your resumes. Uh, use it so that you stand out among everybody else, not just having the certification, but let's make it easy for people to know you have that certification. Um, with that in mind, I want to wish you good luck on your exam and thank you for your time. Uh, if you have uh, questions, let's go over to Q&A here. Um, let's see, open questions. Uh, is there any DevOps path to follow? Uh, well, uh, the um, this, yes and no. Uh, how about a, a really generic answer? Uh, I think that a good DevOps person has a wide range of exposure. Uh, so I, I really wouldn't want to just tell them, oh, you're going to, you just need the CKAD. Uh, the CKAD is aimed at people who are developers and they'd like to know how to get their um, uh, application containerized and integrated into a Kubernetes cluster. So they're used to the monolithic. They figured out, okay, I need microservices. Now what? How do I get that into Kubernetes? So that that tends to overlap with some of DevOps. CKA and CKS also do. So to some extent, um, I don't know if, uh, if there is a good single answer to that question. Uh, I would say if you're going to do security, you want the CKA to get the real broad view of everything, and then the CKS. If you're not going to be doing security, and you just have to choose between the two, and maybe you do a little bit more development than you do operations uh, than the CKAD. But it, it's hard for me because that term has grown a little bit. It's, it means a lot of things now. So it really depends on what, what it is you're doing. But the way I would look at it is, am I mostly in the developer or I want to know that perspective? Am I going to be responsible for the care and feeding of a cluster, uh, you know, day two operations? OK, then that's the CKA content. And then security, of course, for the CKS. Um, do we have bundle promotions for training and certification coming up? That was a question. And the answer is, no, it's just pretending to be frozen there. Um, yes, yes. The good news is the Linux Foundation always has uh, various uh, programs and things that are happening. For example, there's some, some good bundles and stuff going on because of the summit. Black Friday or Black Monday is coming up. Or is it Black Friday? Cyber Monday, Cyber Black Friday. It's two different things. Both are coming up. But in this case, Cyber Monday is coming up, and there's usually a lot of sales there. But the check back with uh, training.linuxfoundation.org. Uh, they also put it on uh, Twitter and other uh, areas because there's, there's often these deals that come through. Uh, and so if you're keeping an eye on it, visiting the page, maybe get a, an email from them, there might be a great bundle that works uh, for you. So the, the short answer is yes, and you just heard the longer answer, of course. Uh, the uh, next one is, can I suggest some practice test resources? Now, the practice test resources, that's a, that's a tough one. That is something that is being worked on. 
uh, traditionally, we would not want to to you know, like mislead you. And part of that non-disclosure that everybody signs before they take the exam is um, don't talk about the exam in any way at any time. So if I told you this was a question on the exam, then I'd be breaking that NDA. Now, I get where you're coming from. And, well, I kind of want to know what I'm looking for. And that's part of what I'm here trying to explain. Uh, one thing I'll mention is when you sign up for an exam, you get two takes. And hopefully that, that brings the extra pressure down a little bit, that you prepare, you follow this process, you take the exam, and you'll have seen it. And with that information, you can take the exam that second time. Uh, so that's something to be aware of is it's the uh, if you go back to the site uh, and look at that certification, I believe, let's just double check that it mentions that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that, let's say CKA, um, A free retake. Yep. So you get a free retake. So as a result, well, I, I, I understand I'd like to see uh, the uh, previous questions then uh, and so forth. I, I get that perspective. At some point, maybe there will be reliable questions. But at this point, if you see a question online, it's somebody who has broken their confidentiality agreement uh, with you. Um, Okay, so can I provide a link to a DevOps path or certification? Um, well, I, you know, the uh, go to, I, I mentioned that uh, information, I think. Um, this is, I don't know if this is another question. Uh, maybe I forgot to, to clear it. Uh, but again, depends on what you're doing in DevOps. Take a look at CKAD, CKA, and the security. There's also, uh, if you go to this training site, there's a checker. Uh, that says, well, where are you trying to go? And it tries to help you with a path. Uh, if you scroll down for some of them, um, they mention, you know, for, for example, here we see uh, learning path. If you scroll down on the page, that says, okay, if you know nothing, maybe start here. We have some boot camps going. They have a um, uh, cloud engineer boot camp and an advanced cloud engineer boot camp that collects uh, several of these online. Uh, or I should say, uh, several of these self-paced courses together. And we have office hours and a forum as well. And you get a, a year of access to that. Um, so uh, if the exam content changes and I bought the training course three months ago, will it be updated until expiry is the question. Yes. So the, uh, the, um, the self-paced courses, both courses really, but the self-paced courses update on a regular basis. Um, I would say that now that Kubernetes has become a little bit more um, stable, uh, the, not stable, but dynamic in a different way is probably a better way of putting it, um, that the courses have a little bit more of a regular cadence. So uh, I update it with every release. It's every three months. And then there's always typos. We use live code. We don't have a demo environment. We go on the internet. We use just... Uh, instances we get from Google or Amazon, and we download all the code live. This isn't a, a prepared environment that we know works and you won't learn anything. We use everything live in my classes. You download the code, and sometimes it, work, it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it breaks. So if we're downloading something from Traffics and they've updated, it may not integrate perfectly anymore with our steps. So what I do is I, I do this all the time. I'm constantly looking at any problems people have on the forums. They send me emails, that sort of thing. Then I figure out what the fix is, and I update the course. So sometimes you might see a course update uh, four times in between releases. Uh, or it might be just twice, just twice that I get to rewrite the course. Uh, but yes, that's, that's what I do pretty much all the time is see what's broken. Usually I, I hear about it. So a trainer or a student says, hey, this step didn't work for me. Oh, okay, let's take a look. Maybe it's a typo. Maybe it's something broke. Maybe it's a typo on my part. Let's fix it. And I'm constantly improving and changing. And, and also because I take the exams on a regular basis, I try to modify things. You're getting the skills you need to be an effective uh, engineer. Uh, so does the training course provide practice lab scenarios similar to real exam scenario, or we try some external source? Uh, so again, this is not a brain dump, but my goal is to make you good admins. So if you have a good admins, you follow the process I've been explaining up to this point, you'll be in a good position to pass the exam 
uh, that's of course no guarantee. It's not a brain dump. Okay? Uh, it is teaching you and guiding you through those lab exercises to gain the skills you need to be an effective and knowledgeable uh, engineer. Um, Next question, can you give us insights how many companies recognize these certifications? Uh, there are some uh, statistics out there. I don't have everything on the tip of my tongue, uh, but uh, I, I would let you know that the, because we have practical exams, it's not a brain dump, multiple guess that you can just take, oh, I took it twice and I learned it um, kind of situation that you really have to know what's going on because of that and because of the digital badges, the certification has been doing really well. And it has not just knowledge, like people are aware of it, it has esteem, meaning that a hiring manager goes, oh, wow, you passed that? That's great. You know, you, you actually learned the stuff. It's not a cert where you show up as long as your credit card clears and you can type your own name, oh, we'll give it to you. It is not like that. You have to know this stuff. You have to know how to do it in two hours. And you have to be able to look at just a command prompt and do all of those steps, fix it, integrate it, uh, work with it, create it, all of that. It, if you don't, to a certain percentage, you don't pass. So the exams and the certification that you get with it have value because we've been able to really make it such that only people who know what they're doing have a tendency of passing. Sometimes people who really know what they're doing don't pass. As I mentioned in the slides, you could make it worse. Sometimes a dumb mistake will break everything because you, you know, I've done it myself in the exam. I've done it myself where I was like, oh, you know, and I'm just gonna make it better. I know what I'm doing. And I messed with something I should not have messed with. And what I broke ended up really affecting everything else. So with something like 10 minutes left in the exam, I effectively turned my system into a brick and I had no time to recover. So I got a zero, <laughs> you know, embarrassing, but that's just it. This isn't just like the real world. You can make it worse. So we're trying to, once you have that certification, it means you, you are, uh, have proven you can be put into a stressful situation and solve the issue. Looks like we're just about out of time. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Uh, there's some contact information in the PDF uh, about the Linux Foundation. Uh, in one of the first slides, you have my Twitter handle and LinkedIn. Uh, hopefully at the next convention or KubeCon, whenever it's going to happen, I'll be able to see you in person. You can often find me at the Linux training booth. So come find us at the booth when we're in person again. You can find stuff like good stickers, sometimes some coupon codes. And of course, you can always ask me questions. Uh, I spend a lot of my time answering questions about stuff. Um, the are the YAML files we put so last question uh, are were the YAML files we bookmarked and accessible to one tab that is open? Well, if they're in one of those three directories and if you bookmarked them on the, the browser that's allowed, so that that's exactly what I talked about in the in this in these slides is do it this way so that you have it easy access uh, and you know how to get to it and you've made your your life as easy as possible. Uh, great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And I'll see you at the next one.